welcome to Chris Ashcraft, who's also from the Seattle group. He's a board member and a very active person up there. Uh, Chris has a bachelor's degree in biology from uh, Wayland Baptist University in Texas and an MS from Texas Tech University. He taught biology down there as well. And he currently works for a, a company called Eden Bioscience, which is near Seattle. And he does, he's a research technician in uh, plant genetics, basically. He's working with cotton, I believe. And, and this fall, he's changing careers. He's, uh, he's going to become a science teacher in a Christian school uh, full time. So uh, be a, a bit of a switch for him. And so we wish him well in that. I had a little chance to talk with Chris on our trip to Mount St. Helens recently. And we had dinner last evening. And he's an interesting guy with a lot of information, a lot to say. And I think you're going to enjoy, enjoy, enjoy what he has to tell you. He's talking about the design of genetic variability. So I'll turn it over to Chris Ashcraft. Especially as your genetics talk. This will be somewhat of a, of a technical lecture, but uh, as long as you've had at least one class on genetics, you should be fine. <laughs> if, I see, if I see anybody getting bored, I might switch over to doing this as a rap or something. <laughs> All right. Um, this presentation is based on a paper that I'm currently trying to get published in TJ, the Answers in Genesis journal called uh, TJ, and uh, the, that article can be found on my website, as well as this presentation can if you want to get in and study it uh, later. My, that's my website address, where you can also find an article by the same title. If uh, all goes well, the article should appear in uh, the issue of TJ following this one coming up. Um, it doesn't look like there will be any holes in that happening, but it, this is a controversial topic, and you'll see why. Uh, currently, there are two schools of thought related to genetic variability. On one hand, the evolutionists say that all genetic variability accumulated through millions of years of random mutagenesis. But the creationists, on the other hand, typically say that there is no new genetic information, that God created all genes in the beginning, and uh, no new genetic information has become somewhat of a mantra for the creation science community and their favorite argument to use against evolution. But is that true? Is it true? Um, my opinion, neither of these perspectives is correct. And we need to uh, do further theory formation to actually come up with an intelligent design based theory on how genetic variability, how diversity in populations is produced. There's a lot of diversity we find in populations. You never see two people that look the same and uh, look at all the diversity in the dog breeds. So that's what we're going to be looking at. Creation science is basically science from the presupposition that God created the earth as described in the Bible. It is not, its sole purpose is not to argue evolution, but because evolution is perhaps, in my opinion, one of the most anti-Christian influences on earth today, it is a, the primary focus of creation science. Um, but because of that, it's probably more important that we actually study evolution than any other science discipline other than cell biology or physiology and we, that we study evolution. Not evolution as the atheists teach it, but how diversity really is accomplished. What are the cellular mechanisms behind diversity? We need to really establish those theories ourselves. We're largely accepting evolutionist theories or the portion of it that fit into our perspective and, and there's been very little theory formation in this area from creationists. Um, this is basically my outline. We'll look at some terminology, try to bring all y'all up to speed on basic terminology and definitions. We'll look at the problems related to existing theories, the mechanisms involved with genetic variability and uh, how this all points, uh, points to evidence of design. Okay, all organisms on Earth are, are made up of one or more microscopic cells, meaning that you can only see them under a microscope. And cells are basically like a factory full of machinery. And we are looking at them from a great distance trying to determine the function of things going on within it. We cannot enter the cell. We cannot watch that machinery go um, function. We do not have the microscopic capability to actually see DNA or proteins in action or in their functional forms. We just do not have the ability to really see what's going on in this factory. Another analogy would be to say that the cell is like a computer. I love to use the analogy that it's like a computer. It has been built 
by an intelligent designer. And uh, it is more complicated than a computer. We are still really ignorant as far as the, how a cell really functions. We know just some of the basics, but we still do not know how many things are accomplished, such as protein folding. We, we don't know all the basics of, many of, of, many of, what, what, of much of what's going on inside the cell. And I, I equate the nucleus of the cell, or organelles within the cell, the nucleus is where DNA is stored in, in, in eukaryotic organisms. I equate that to like the hard drive of the computer. There are many analogies you can draw between the computer and uh, a cell. Chromosomes, all organisms possess chromosomes. From bacteria to, uh, to humans, we all possess chromosomes. A chromosome is a long piece of DNA that contains many genes. In humans, there are approximately a thousand genes per chromosome. So it's just a long string of DNA. And DNA itself is information. It's, it's, it's information pure and simple. It's, it is like a program in, on your hard drive. DNA is, like, is basically like the programs on your hard drive. And genes, we've all heard of genes, genes make proteins. Basically, that's their function. They are more um, specifically codes, program codes that tell the cell what proteins to make. And proteins are the machinery. They are the materials and the machinery that make life happen. They are the brick layers and, and the bricks. If in any one particular case they are not the bricks, they are not the building blocks also, they are the mortar. Proteins do everything and they are everything and that's why DNA is so important because DNA is, are the codes that make proteins and proteins do everything. Your hair is, proteins make your hair, but your hair is also made of pure protein. Proteins make your fingernails, but your fingernails themselves are also made of pure proteins. Now there are other building blocks, but nonetheless, proteins are very important. Just for the point of interest, humans have 46 chromosomes. These are chromosomes as they appear before cell division. But in this form, before they condense for cell division, in this form, your chromosomes are 1.5 meters long each. And they condense down to an incomprehensibly dense structure prior to cell division. And the humans have 46 chromosomes. You receive 23 from one of your parents and 23 from the other. That's what sexual reproduction is. Uh, your parents give half their DNA to the new offspring. So this is how the genetic code works. And DNA is basically a is, is code, it's program code. In fact, Bill Gates said that a gene is by far the most sophisticated program around. That's, you know, it's program code. So this is how it works. DNA is a long stream of coding characters. And three of those characters in a particular order is the code for an amino acid. So DNA is a string of nucleotides and protein is a string of amino acids. Three nucleotides in one particular order is, is codes for an amino acid in the protein chains, such as this. A UGC is a code for a cysteine, and a CUG is a code for leucine, these being amino acids. So that's how the code works. It's basically a program code that your cell will translate into a sequence of amino acids to make proteins. As you can see from that illustration, well, there are four nucleotides, four possible nucleotides used in DNA, and there are 20 different amino acids used in protein. So you can see that if you change any one nucleotide, you can change the amino acid that that codon, that, that little coding unit, is coding for. There are two possible sources of genetic variability, one being mutations. A mutation is a change that is unintentional. Uh, the result of exposures to foreign mutagens, such as UV bombardment or chemical mutagens, or errors that are caused by the cell, errors during replication of DNA, the copying of DNA, or by errors during DNA splicing. Mutations are unintentional changes to the DNA, whereas the other source of variability is recombination. Recombination is an intentional change to, a, to the genes um, that is purpose, purposefully introduced by the cell. But currently, there is no way to tell which of those mechanisms is responsible for changing a gene. Following cell division, you can look at the sequence of the two daughter cells, but there's absolutely no way to tell whether a mutation or genetic recombination was responsible for a genetic change. Yet we know that evolutionists basically attribute all changes to genes as due to mutations. Well, variations 
exists within a population because you have many genes for any particular characteristic. Um, you can have many genes for eye, many different genes for eye color. You can have a gene for blue eyes or a gene for green eyes or a gene for red eyes or whatnot. And you can have many genes for hair color. There are many genes that code for any particular characteristic. And that's the reason why diversity, such as that we see in the bench, that's the reason why that diversity exists, is because genes exist as many varieties. But we also know that genes today are variable. Genes just are, do not, not stay fixed the way they have always been. They are variable. Generally speaking, the genes that you pass to your offspring are not always exactly the same as those that you receive from your parents. There are slight changes. And in fact, you possess genes today that you were not even born with. Okay? Genes are variable. And we need to come to terms with how that variable is created because scientists today are... Our evolutions, they don't see a purpose behind you. They don't see that cell actually is designed to create genetic variability and tend to attribute all variability to mutations. We have to understand that the theory of evolution was actually developed before we knew anything about genetics, before we knew anything about DNA. The theory of evolution had already become widely accepted. Darwin's Origins, uh, Origin of Species was published in 1859. But Gregor Mendel, who is considered the father of modern, modern genetics, his work wasn't published until many years later and largely ignored until 1900. Um, Charles Darwin proposed that variability was a result of just random changes, just random changes, uh, with, and, whereas Gregor Mendel showed that variability within populations was um, expressed in, in very specific patterns, indicating that there was a cellular mechanism involved. Gregor Mendel established some of the basic, basics of genetics that we still recognize today as being true, and uh, some of those will be important for our discussion. He performed, he, Gregor Mendel was a monk, and he was uh, the monastery gardener as well. He did plant breeding and kept statistical notes, and through these breeding experiments, he established the foundations of, of genetics as we still know it today. First, he created pure breed plants with a variety of different characteristics. Uh, he, most of his were on peas, but he used other plants as well. He would create a pure breed plant for a particular characteristic. He would create a pure breed plant that had round seeds versus a pure breed plant that had wrinkled seeds of yellow flowers and one that had green flowers and, and one that was tall versus one that was dwarf. He would create a pure breed plant. It's easy to create pure breeds. You, you inbreed the, the characteristic that you want to be pure in the offspring. And with the plant, that's relatively easy because you can self-pollinate the plant. And then you back-cross it. You take the offspring and you cross that again with the parent. And so you inbreed a particular characteristic and eventually you eliminate variability with the offspring. An organism is a pure breed if every one of its offspring looks just like the parent. It's easy to do. My background is in genetic transformations. I was brought to the Northwest by a biotech company to genetically transform plants. And following insertion, of, following transformation of a plant, we would have to create a pure breed to give to your employer, one that's genetically pure for that gene. And that means the parent will pass that gene to every one of their offspring. Nonetheless, this is, this is, these are the types of experiments that uh, Mendel, Mendel uh, performed. He would take these pure breed plants and he would cross them. And what he found was that all of the offspring would have one of the characteristics or the other, showing that one trait was dominant over the other. So when you cross a round versus a wrinkle seed plant, all the offspring would be round. And this was found for several different traits. So he established that some traits were dominant over the others. But when he, when he self-pollinated this hybrid, he found that a particular ratio, he found that the recessive trait would show up again in those offspring, and it was always in a particular ratio, a three to one ratio. For every, for every offspring that had the the recessive trait, three would have the dominant trait. And this was, this was consistent for all traits that he compared. There was always a three to one ratio found in the offspring. Well, what, what Mendel figured out was that for every trait that you possess, well, one thing, he, he determined that traits mm, are, inher are inherited as distinct units. Today, we call those units genes. And he also figured out that 
that every one of these units existed as a pair. You received basically two genes, one from each of your parents. So for every trait that you have, you basically have two genes that code for that trait. One of those genes is frequently dominant over the others, but not always. So he established some of those uh, basic principles of genetics that we still, still know to be true. These are pilot squares. You will um, do many of these if you uh, take genetics. Uh, and these are what Mendel used to diagram the results of his breeding experiments and establish some of the principles of genetics. What this shows are the genes that are possessed by one parent versus the genes that are possessed by another parent and the outcomes. The, this, these are the two genes that were, that were possibly donated by the, say, the, the pure breed round plant versus the two genes that were donated by the pure breed wrinkle plant and therefore all the possible genotypes that could be possessed by the offspring from those two crosses, all right? So these are the hybrids that he, that he got from, his, from crossing two pure breeds, and then he crossed those two, those two hybrids. These are the two genes that, that are possessed by a hybrid, and these are the two genes possessed by the other hybrid, and the three to one ratio that results. Three of them being round because each of them has at least one dominant gene, and one of them being wrinkled because it doesn't have any. Well, more importantly, what, we, what he figured out was what a pure breed actually is. A pure breed is an individual that does no longer have genetic variability. It has two of the exact same genes for, any, for that particular trait. The trait that he was pure breeding, once there's no longer any diversity in the offspring, that is because that organism no longer has genetic diversity for that trait that it has two of the same genes for that particular trait. That's what a pure breed is. Well, we now have a great history of breeding. We've been doing a lot of breeding. All, any farm animal, any domesticated animal has been aggressively bred by humans today. We have a serious breeding history that we now, um, that we can now look back on and uh, use for theory formation. But this hasn't really been accurately used to, to, to determine what's going on in genetic diversity. Much of the dog breed, many of the dog breeds that we have today, in fact, are very recent, uh, isolated within the last few hundred years. I have, I have American Eskimos, and they are, are very new breed. But nonetheless, breeding histories are a matter of historic fact today. And although it was speculative for some time, we now know that all the dog breeds were bred from the gray wolf. Through genetic studies, this has been fairly recently determined. Well, the creationists basically all agree that the gray wolf itself is just one member of a larger a biblical kind. That there was an ancestor dog on board the ark, and from that ancestor dog, dog you've had a number of different naturally occurring canines develop through genetic diversity and natural selection. You now have a bunch of wolves, you have a bunch of coyotes, you have a bunch of foxes, you have dingoes, you have jackals, hyenas, etc. Most creationists agree that the family level of scientific classification is largely a biblical kind within mammals. King and Bible class or family genus species, that family level of classification within that scheme is generally considered to be what a biblical kind is synonymous with. So we know that, that all the dogs have been bred from the wolf, and that the wolf is part of a larger canine kind. The evolutionists have originally proposed that the wolf already possessed all the genetic diversity that was necessary to create all these dog breeds. And the creationists have basically uh, accepted this theory. The evolutionists say that that genetic diversity accumulated through millions of years of random mutations. And that the dog breeds were basically created by rearranging the genetic information that was already possessed by the wolf. Well, this overlooks a very, a very obvious fact that the wolf itself was a pure breed. Remember, the wolf was purebred by nature. That's what selection does. It's the same thing that breeders accomplish by doing artificial breeding and inbreeds an animal with a particular trait. The wolf itself was a pure breed, along with the fox, along with the hyena, the jackal. All these animals were bred to be pure breeds in nature and have been selected to be purebreds for hundreds and thousands, and thousands of years. But we know the wolf was a purebred. So the big question that remains is how was the variability that's in all these dog breeds <coughs> generated in a relatively short period of time from what was a, a genetic pure breed, 
a genetic homozygote in nature. That's just some of that's just largely overlooked today, but what I consider to be a very key, um, very key factor as far as the formation of these theories. Sure, go ahead. Um, I'm not sure why you say that they are purebred. Uh, all all wolves give birth to wolves' pups. Right, but you, there could, uh, from population to population and from individual to individual, there could be much variety. I mean, there's much variety. There's very individual. little variety found in nature. Gray wolves give birth to gray wolf pups, and they always give birth to gray wolf pups all in nature. Well, human beings only give rise to human beings, but there's a huge amount of variety. You still have races. Purebredness is, is the result of inbreeding a particular characteristic. The fact remains, a wolf give, always gives birth to wolf pups. You can wait as long as you want, and a wolf is never going to give birth to a Great Dane or a Chihuahua or any of that kind of diversity that we play. I think it will become more apparent what I'm actually referring to. There is another major problem that presents itself, and that being the global flood. Fortunately for us, unlike the evolutionists, we have some significant biblical insight that we can apply to our theories. And one of those is the exact number of animals for any biblical kind that were on board the ark. That means we know the exact amount of genetic information that any biblical kind had when it was brought on board the ark. There were two breeding pairs for every single biblical kind seven breeding pairs for any that were considered clean. What exactly that means, I don't think we really know. Many people think that clean meant that they were going to be eaten. So regardless, there were a maximum of seven breeding pairs for any given biblical kind. There were eight people on board the ark. The reason why that is important is because we now know that every gene in the genome has a fixed location on the chromosome called its locus. So the, to the, the gene for round peas versus wrinkled peas, for example, red flowers versus white flowers, has a fixed location on the chromosome. You have one chromosome, also one gene that you receive from each parent. So every individual only has two genes per locus, period. You have one, one chromosome that you receive from your mother, one chromosome that you receive from your father. For each chromosome that you have, you have a duplicate pair you receive from your other parents and a duplicate gene that you receive from the other parents, generally speaking. A homozygote is an individual that has the same gene at that location. That's what a pure grade is. You end up with two big R's at the same location, two genes for round, two genes for wrinkles at the same location. Every individual has two genes per locus, Therefore, we know the maximum number of genes per locus that was saved from the flood that was animals that were on board the ark. If you have seven breeding pairs, 14 individuals, you have a maximum of 28 genes available at each locus. For the number of people that were on board the ark, you have a maximum of 16 genes that could be, that could be original at any particular locus. But today, we know that there are indeed hundreds and even thousands of genes present at many locus within the genome. Recombination is the name for, for the reactions that generate unique offspring. The reason why every offspring from the same parent is unique is because of reactions we call genetic recombination. They are not mutants. The children are, do, are not different because they are mutants, although our brothers, I'm not sure, really sure. <laughs> That recombination occurs during the cell division that, that produces offspring, and as well the cell division that occurs in normal cells as well. The process is a little bit different, but the changes occur to be remarkably similar. This is how the cell life cycle works. For about nine tenths of the cell's life, it is working on replicating its DNA. You have a big genome, you have a lot of genetic information. Through most of its life cycle, it's working on replicating that DNA. Once it gets all of it, rep all of it replicated, the last tenth of its life, it undergoes genetic recombination. It alters the genome in largely uncharacterized, unchar un uncharacterized manner. But that's when recombination occurs, just prior to cell division. As I said, the, our chromosomes are 1.5 meters long each. When they're in that form, they are active. You can replicate them, you can produce proteins from them. When, they enter, when you enter cell division, your chromosomes condense into an incomprehensible dense structure, and at that point, they become inactive for production of proteins. So that period of cell life cycle is, needs to be very short because it's not able to accomplish much. Prior to cell division, the DNA that's in the nucleus is un unwound like this and active 1.5 meters, 46 chromosomes, 1.5 meters long each in humans 
and those structures condense, condense further into distinct units, into 46 distinct units that each pair up. So you have 46 chromosomes that pair into 23 homologous pairs, and at that time they perform genetic recombination. We do not know exactly what is going on in genetic recombination today. Those are all theories, but that's, that's how your chromosomes appear before they undergo genetic recombination. And it's only at this stage that they are visible to us even microscopically. We even with scanning electron microscopes, we cannot see DNA in its sink in the, the double helix form that we typically recognize to be uh, DNA, just in a chromosome form when they're in this level of density. Just so you can understand the next diagram, because all cells have replicated all their DNA prior to division, each chromosome exists as a duplicate strand. They're not actually visible in this form, but for diagrammatic purposes. This is how they've been constructed. Prior to division, the two, you have 46 chromosomes, 23 from your mother, 23 from your father. Each of these 23 pair up to two homologous pairs, and they undergo genetic recombination. So you have a chromosome that you receive from your mother, another chromosome that you receive from your father. Each of those pair up and undergo genetic recombination along the cell axis just prior to division. And at that time, Genetic information is exchanged. Reactions are reactions occur. We really don't know all of what's going on. Remember, we've only sequenced one human cell so thus far, so we really don't know exactly what's going on in genetic recombination. Only the big, only some of the big picture items have been figured out so far. But again, homologous sequence, homologous chromosomes, homologous sequences basically just means that they're similar. We, the level of simi similarity that was re that's required, we really don't know that either, but they possess genes with the same traits. They are generally similar chromosomes, similar genes that undergo these types of reactions. Again, just another diagram showing the condensed chromosomes as they are undergoing recombination. You see how many of these are interlinked? <coughs> many of these are, cross are folding over each other along the cell axis, and then division occurs. I can see the exact changes that occur during the combination are still largely unknown. But it's assumed, generally assumed, that during these, well, number one, it's not, it's not assumed that these reactions were designed in the beginning, okay? That the only reason these chromosomes even come together along the cell axis is to ensure proper division of genetic material and that they bind together to make sure that they are all separated to two individual daughter cells and that exchange of genetic material just happened to occur. And that that exchanging of genetic material was advantageous and then was further accentuated by selective pressure. It's not believed that genetic recombination is, was supposed to happen, but it's certainly not believed to be a design process nor uh, but simply creating diversity because it just happened to occur and that was advantageous. But it's assumed that currently the purpose of genetic recombination is just to shuffle pre-existing genes and create diversity that way. And creationists have largely accepted this theory. It fits within their perspective that God created all the genetic information in the beginning. They like that. And so diversity is just the result of rearranging pre-existing genetic information. That kind of fits into, into our perspective. This is a quote, a uh, recent quote by Lane Lester, who is the uh, executive editor, editor of the Creation Research Society Quarterly, and a geneticist, a PhD in genetics, who said in a recent article, recombination explains why children look different from their parents. This shuffling of the genes can produce serious, superior combinations of different genes. However, because we see that mutations are incapable of supplying useful variation, <coughs> useful genes that are there to be shuffled must have been created at the beginning. Well, it is true that mutations are not a credible source of genetic information. You're going to destroy information if you just randomly change it. But saying that all genes must have been created in the beginning is just not giving the cell credit for what it might very well have been designed to do. Remember that this molecular machinery was created by God, and we do not have this machinery figured out at all. All right? But it is clear that there is more genetic diversity accumulating in populations than uh, it's explicable otherwise. We need to start looking at the cell for the ability to edit genes. 
Because yeah, that, that is exactly what's going on. Crossing over does occur. And, and diversity within a population is, can definitely, is definitely accomplished strictly through crossing over. Meaning that, well, I'm not sure I even showed what that previous diagram was actually illustrated. This again, are, two, are the chromosomes received through your mother and the chromosomes received through your father and the genes arranged along its length. And what can happen is a recombination event occurs between these genes and switch out the genes so that the gene that was on your mother's chromosome ends up on your father's chromosome and vice versa. All right? So that's what we call a gene crossover. Well, we know that that occurs, and it can be easily demonstrated in experiments. This experiment is performed in every single genetics lab in the country, by, without a doubt. Um, and I don't want to go into this in any great deal. Detail, but it does demonstrate that crossing over occurs and that crossing over it accomplishes diversity. Remember that there are specific, that there's a locus, a fixed location of genes on the chromosome. You start with a, well, this is a hybrid created just the way uh, Mendel created his hybrids by crossing two pure breeds. There was a pure breed fly with red eyes and yellow body, and a pure breed fly with white eyes and brown body. He crossed those together and got this hybrid. And then he crosses this fly with one that has basically neither of those, none of those characteristics. And all the offspring should either have one trait or the other. All the offspring should either be red eyed and yellow body or white eyed and brown body. But when you look at the offspring, you find that a select few have a red eye and a brown body, and some have a white eye and a yellow body, showing that. The genes must have crossed over. They must have moved from one chromosome to the other. So crossing over definitely occurs. But this is the most obvious manifestation of what is going on in genetic recombination. That's just a thousand reactions could occur and still only recognizable to us as a single crossing over event. We just have no idea. And crossing over are only demonstrated by examining populations like this. So it's just the fact that there's been a bulk movement of DNA from one chromosome to the other that's illustrated that anything was going on in the first place. We have not done comparative sequence analysis, but only a handful of genes. We only have sequenced one human cell. You would have to sequence every sperm cell or every egg that's produced by an individual to actually figure out what is going on in DNA recombination. But Recombination uh, has shown itself to not be random by any means. That was the assumption. Well, recombination wasn't designed and just happened to, happen to occur because, you know, to ensure proper division. But, and, and then it's just random along the length of a chromosome. And in fact, this assumption was used while constructing genetic maps. You can get information by these crossovers. By examining these populations of flies, you can figure out, number one, that the gene is on the same chromosome. If two traits cross over like that, you can deduce that those traits are on the same chromosome. And furthermore, the more often that a crossover occurs, the further they are from one another. If, if there's a great distance between them, there are more possibilities for recombination between. Therefore, the distance between two genes on a chromosome and the more frequently they cross over are were thought to be comparable. So, and the, if, they, if a crossover almost never occurs between a gene, they're thought to be very close to one another. That's how genetic mapping was originally established through crossover frequencies. There are many different types of genetic maps now, but nonetheless, we now know that crossing over is not at all random, not at all a random process. There are what we call hot spots and cold spots of activity. There are regions of the chromosomes that experience quite frequent genetic recombination, quite frequently crossovers occur there, versus regions where almost no crossovers occur. We know that there are sex-specific differences in recombination. Females generally see higher rates of recombination than males do, and, and recombination typically occurs in the distal regions of the chromosome versus the proximal regions. We also know that there's a significant difference between recombination frequencies in um, sex cell division versus normal cell division. They're, this is they're clearly not a random reaction by any means. And it's easy to see that if indeed recombination occurred within a gene, that you can create new alleles. Alleles is an important term, you want to remember that. An allele is basically a, a variation of a gene. As opposed to recombination occurring between the neutral regions between genes, if it occurred within a gene, you can immediately create two new alleles for any particular at any particular locus. In fact, you 
you can, you can double the number of alleles within the population for each and every offspring that you produce. If indeed, genetic recomb the purpose of recombination is to perform such functions. Now remember, the purpose is still, really still theoretic, what it's actually attempting to accomplish. But we know one thing, that replication is, is intentionally verbatim. The cell is trying to copy the DNA exactly the way it is. There are a lot of checks. There are mechanisms to repair any errors that are that creep in. And we know replication is supposed to be exactly the way it is. It's supposed to copy chromosomes exactly the way they are. And that recombination is altering the chromosomes in a largely uncharacterized manner. Any changes to changes the genes that are found should be assumed the result of recombination. One reaction is intentionally changing the genome. The other is not intentionally changing the genome. We should be assuming that recombination is responsible for any genetic change unless it is demonstrated otherwise. But instead, the very opposite is, is, uh, is the case. Well, we now know that recombination is not just involved with rearranging pre-existing genes. That's what a lot of people think. When you say recombination, well, I thought recombination was just the rearranging genes during, uh, during cell division. Recombination does a bunch of things. Recombination is basically when you take a homologous piece of DNA and use that to edit another homologous region. That is just, it is used in a broad number of reactions. Like we already said, it creates diversity during cell division, but it's also used to repair several types of DNA damage. In fact, it is used to repair damage that was originally attributed to other mechanisms. It is used to incorporate foreign DNA. We know that transformation, genetic transformations now are occurring. I'll try to get into some of that potentially after our break, uh, exactly what kind of transformations are possible. It is induced by a wide variety of environmental stresses. Almost any environmental stress will induce homologous recombination. Nutrient deprivation, high cell densities, high temperatures, great many carcinogens induce homologous recombination. It is induced or shut off as a pre-programmed cell function in differentiation or development. That means uh, when a cell is taking on a specialized role. Every cell in your body has the exact same DNA, and at some point during embryo development, they are assigned their roles, and they begin to specialize into nerve cells versus blood cells, skin cells, and while they are differentiating into those specialized form, recombination occurs there too. But we really don't know what its intended products are either. But a new class of homologous recombination has been recently discovered called gene conversion. This is not an excellent diagram, but one that I used, one that I replicated in an ex its exact form from a recent research publication, and I used it in my paper, so you're getting stuck with it too. <laughs> but basically, gene, con gene conversion differs from crossing over in that instead of two homologous chromosomes crossing over and exchanging genetic information, one of the chrom homologous chromosomes is altered and the other is not. The other is not changed. That's what we call gene conversion. More typically, regions from elsewhere in the genome are brought in. Template DNA from elsewhere in the genome is brought in and edited. Only one of the alleles on, homo on the homo homologous pairs of chromosomes. Most of the time, that those are pseudogenes that are used as template DNA. Pseudogenes, we, they have forever called um, junk DNA. Junk DNA that used to be used but no longer has a function. There's, there's no junk in, in the genome any more than there's junk on your hard drive. I've loaded all of information on my hard drive. I don't know what all that stuff does, but if I go on the system folder and start assuming some of that's junk, you know? <laughs> yeah. So gene conversion is, is, is a only recently recognized mechanism, but um, it appears to be responsible for most of the genes we call variable genes. Now, now there are many genes that are variable. Most genes in the genome are not. Most genes in the genome are involved with housekeeping functions, such as DNA replication, production of proteins, metabolism, the production of energy from uh, metabolites. Most of the genes in the genome are housekeeping genes involved with these normal cellular functions, and they remain constant from one generation to the next. You can check vastly unrelated organisms and find also that those genes are typically the same. But some genes are constant. Some genes are variable. But they are not randomly variable. In any given variable gene, there is a distinct variable and invariable region. Every variable gene that we know of. We also call them hyper-variable genes because these genes are, are frequently 
more variable than the neutral regions between genes. Not random mutation involved. A variable gene is a variable by intent. That cell is intentionally altering certain regions of certain genes. Well, most interestingly, genes that are involved with interspecies contacts are frequently variable. Genes that are involved with predator-prey interactions, for example, um, frequently variable. As well, the antagonists of a variable gene are frequently also variable. Venoms, toxins, <coughs> peptide to protein toxins that are produced by all organisms across the board are variable. As well are the genes that organisms use to produce antitoxins. So antitoxins are also extremely variable. Antagonists of any variable gene are almost always variable as well. Antibodies are our best characterized variable genes to date. And if you think you know all about uh, variability during antibodies, I guarantee you do not, because some uh, advanced have been um, made in just the last few years. Antibodies are a protein that is produced by your body to label a foreign substance as foreign. Once it's labeled as a foreign substance, your body can get rid of it. You have cells that produce antibodies called a B cell. Every cell that produces antibodies only produces one antibody. And that antibody only labels <coughs> one foreign substance. But there's a billion foreign substances, unlimited number of foreign substances that you can come across. So the ability of a limited number of genes to label an unlimited number of foreign substances has been a source of speculation, great source of speculation, but largely attributed to random mutations. This is what the antibody looks like. It's a, it has a Y-shaped structure. It comes along, binds to a typically a, on, in, on organisms, it binds to a cell membrane protein or a virus approach the protein code. It binds to the foreign object, and then it, your, your body knows to get rid of it. It's a label that labels a foreign substance as a foreign substance, and, and, and then other white blood cells can come in and uh, either swallow it up, there's one that swallows it up, and another that just injects basically poison into it as well. The body gets rid of it. This is the structure of an antibody. Antibody is composed of several different proteins made up of several different genes. Um, and there's a constant region. Variable genes are not randomly variable. There's always a con of an invariable and a variable region of any variable gene. The antibody binding site, the antigen binding site of the antibody is variable, highly variable. It's and it, it attaches to an antigen much, much like a locking key mechanism. Assumed to be the result of random mutations, it is now known that repeated rounds of gene conversion, the process of gene conversion using a template DNA and such to come in and alter gene, repeated rounds of gene conversion occur on that variable gene in order to develop what we call immunity maturity. Increased affinity, increased binding to, to the foreign particle is accomplished by repeated rounds of gene conversion on the variable portion of the gene. So it's the binding portion of the gene that is variable, then you have a, a, a great invariable portion of the gene. Well, we know that antibodies can bind a billion different substances. Originally it was found that a great portion of the reason why you can produce so many antibodies was because there's so many subunits involved with assembling a functional antibody protein. This is the variable portion of the antibody gene. It is assembled from many different subunits. More than 100 different subunits can contribute to the formation of the variable portion of the antibody gene. These lie to a million base pairs away. It'll take one of these subunits one of these subunits and one of these subunits and assemble them together to make the variable portion of the antibody gene. That You can make a lot of antibodies just through that alone. But in addition to that, there are several different constant portions. The invariable portion of the gene is attached to it, and there are a bunch of subunits that can be added there as well. So even without any additional variability added, your body has a lot of sequences it can use to, be make, to make uh, antibodies, and that was you know, the original explanation for why you can produce so many antibodies is because there's so many subunits involved. But later we found that there's additional variability in this variable gene that cannot be explained once they sequence all these subunits. When they found that out, that was originally attributed to inaccurate splicing of these three regions. 
In fact, the textbook we were given when I took recombinant DNA technology in 95 states that exact same thing. That the hyper, what we call hyper variability within the V, within the variable range of this gene, is, an, is the result of inaccurate splicing of these three domains. But we now know that is not true. In fact, splicing of these three regions will occur without any hyper variability if an enzyme called AID, activase induced deaminase, is not present. That enzyme is also necessary for gene conversion to occur. Now, there are two mechanisms used to induce hypervariability in this variable region. All animals use both mechanisms, but some animals use one mechanism preferentially over the others. One is using pseudogene to implant DNA. It'll use a pseudo piece of pseudogene from the, usually the same chromosome, but more a greater distance away, bring that in and splice that in to create additional variability in this region. In humans, single nucleotide changes are introduced. As opposed to using template DNA, mechanisms are still largely unknown, but AID is required for this reaction to occur, and instead of using template DNA, single nucleotide changes are introduced into that region. Your immunity to diseases is specifically the result of additions at the level of single nucleotide changes. That is new information that's being added. And it's custom. You're making a custom antibody to label a specific antigen, a specific foreign substance. You do not make the antibody until you have come across the antigen. Do not make it until you actually come across it. So your B cell binds the antigen first and then makes the antibody to match it. Well, I've always known that antibody production was not random. I remember having uh, discussions 10 years ago with fellow students. You know, they just claim this stuff was random. How can it be random? Whether or not you develop it or not, it's not questionable. When they came out with polio vaccine, for example, vaccine for smallpox, not, it was not random whether or not it was going to occur. Well, you can get this shot, but whether or not you're going to get, you know, and gain immunity from it is we don't know because it's all random. It's a guarantee. It is a cure. Every single person in the population that receives a vaccination will develop immunity, and that's how we wipe diseases from the population such as polio. I had an aunt die of polio that I've never met, but polio and smallpox from the modernized world from the communities that have received these vaccinations, these diseases are gone because immunity is not random. It's not the result of random changes. They are custom changes responding to particular antigens. Now, serum, just for your, a serum is basically the protein that an invasive organism will possess. So they take a virus and they denature the protein and, and inject you with some of the protein that's on the outside, the protein that the antibody could recognize and bind to. They basically inject some of that foreign protein into you and it gives your body the chance to develop these antibodies to label that foreign protein and that foreign uh, pathogen in the event that you come across it. But they're not all random. So it's not random uh, genetic diversity that creates a certain outcome. And immunization is just certain. It's certain. Well, antibody diversity is not inherited diversity, and you'll, sorry. But they are the best characterized of all variable genes. We've been studying antibody diversity for 30 years. 30 years we've known that the ver that antibody genes had were variable. And you possess thousands of antibody genes for antibodies now that you were not born with. So you have a lot of them. But probably the, the gene that is, it is inherited that we know the most about is what they call a major histocompatibility complex. I'm only going to say that once. What they see is uh, is all. now before we do sequence analysis, comparative sequence analysis, there has to be a motivating reason, and that is almost usually medical treatments. You just don't. You're not going to sequence genes from various organisms for no reason. That's the reason we know so little about gene diversity is because there has to be a motivation. There has to be funding behind it, uh, you know, before you actually get some. Well, there is a good reason to, to sequence a major histopathically complex because it is a protein that all of your cells possess that label your cells as a self. Major, the MHC is the reason why tissues are rejected upon transplantation. They have chemicals that they can use to suppress the system, but the MHC is a protein that labels your body as self. 
MHC locusts are very variable, highly variable. But in addition, they serve a role in immunization. Just to point that out briefly. Like I said before, the, the cells that produce antibodies, the B cells, they do not produce antibodies until they bind an antigen. The B cell will bind an antigen using a cell membrane bound protein, internalize that antigen, denature it, bind a portion of that antigen to the MHC, to the MHC and, and present that on the outside of the cell, where another cell, the helper T cell, will come and find that. It will check if that cell possesses the MHC and is presenting an antigen to it. It'll try to tell the B cell, okay, go ahead and make me have some antibodies for that antigen. The B cells do not have a uh, continuous life cycle like all other cells. They're produced by a bone model. They have one life cycle, and if they do not receive a signal from the helper T cell to Go ahead and close, start cloning yourself and replicate like all other cells, they're done. But once they bind the helper T cell, the helper T cell recognizes, okay, you have an antigen, you are one of mine, okay, you start cloning yourself and churn me out a bunch of antibodies. So, but without the MHC complex as well, uh, it's just a check to make sure that you're. But antibodies are not produced until you bind an antigen, until it internalizes that antigen, and then custom fits an antibody to match. Well, in 1999, we, they, they sequenced the MHC loci. With many, <clears throat> as with many different proteins, big proteins, there are several genes involved with making these proteins, and that's the case with the MHC. There are several different locus. It's a loci, it's a, it's a plural form. Um, we know that gene conversion is involved with creating this hypervariability as well. For each of these locus, now these numbers are fairly up to date. Only a few years ago, these numbers were greatly uh, less than they are here. But within locus A, they've already identified 220 alleles. And locus C, they've already identified 110. Locus B, 460. Locus uh, DR, alpha and beta subunits, 361, 70, and 116. And remember that I told you that you only possess two genes per locus, maximum. There were eight people on board the ark. 16 alleles per locus is all that could have been saved from the flood and reintroduced subsequently. But we now know that for some locus, there are hundreds. And we only sequenced this gene in 90, these genes in 99 and started doing comparative sequence analysis. So just since 99, we've recognized these number of locus and uh, these number of alleles, and these numbers will, um, will, will, you know, this is just the beginning of how many we know about. Venoms across the board are variable. One of our best characterized to date are variable. And specifically, we know we've done sequence analysis of some of these because um, venoms produced by many organisms block ion channels that are used by neurotransmitters. And they will use these venoms to treat diseases, neurological diseases such as epilepsy. You block these ion channels, suppress these uh, neurological problems, and uh, so they are, they have a great pharmacological, pharmacological value as well, and so they've been studied, and studied because they recognize that there's great diversity. There's, these toxins have specificity. You have some that just induce um, immediate paralysis, other that's, others that will induce convulsions, and others that have strong analgesic properties. In fact, uh, the cone, the cone, the cone scale toxins are probably the best characterized to date because of this. There was a lot of variability found there, a lot of specificity. And the cone snail toxin acts so rapidly that it's able to use it to catch fish. It actually has a harpoon that will shoot out and able to stun a fish so rapidly that it can catch fish. A snail is able to, is able to catch fish. Or other mollusks. You know that when you touch a snail, it's going to suck up in its shell almost immediately. The toxin acts so fast, it can uh, it can sting a mollusk and send in kind of convulsions and able to paralyze it before it even has a chance to recoil into its shell. So it acts very, very rapidly. Well, they've done some sequence analysis of this already, and it's been estimated that there are 100 different alleles, 100 different peptide toxins per species with approximately 15, 50,000 found throughout the genus. These genes are highly, highly variable. But as with all, uh, I forgot to point out a, an indication of, of non-randomness in uh, the MHC locus. 
Um, we know that the, those changes are not uh, random. There's a specific variable, an invariable region, the MHC locus, and specifically CG dimers uh, appear to be involved in the region where there's hypervariability. They're, they're always indicating that we've seen now that there are patterns, not only patterns, but uh, specific regions, specific s signaling sequences that tell, uh, that indicate where hypervariability occurs. That's the case also with the, with the conotoxin gene hypervariability. We've now found that within the most variable portion of that gene, there are conserved locus. The locus is, is the three nucleotides that code for a particular amino acid. Um, that there's a scaffolding formation, a conserved sequence of codons, cysteine codons, within the most variable portion of this gene. It's not random variability, it's not random mutations involved, but there's a, there's a specific pattern. As well, there's a preponderance for transitional nucleotide exchange, such as an AT will be switched out for TA instead of to a CG or a GC. There's a preponderance for a particular type of nucleotide exchanges in the variable portion of the chromatoxin. You recognizing these shells? I used to actually have a couple when I was a kid down yeah, there. They were quite the collector's items. Uh, thousand dollars uh, to some of them for to collect them. So as I mentioned before, there, the antagonists for variable genes are also frequently variable. Um, we now know that, that the genes that are used to make antitoxins are also quite variable. As well, we've realized that the antigens, the protein that your body typically recognizes with the antibody, those are also highly variable. Path, you know, organisms that create uh, diseases such as uh, par uh, parasites, bacteria, fungi, and like you know, you know, parasitic worms and things. They have antigens that your antibodies are, are labeling. Those are highly variable. It changes them rapidly to try to defeat your antibody system and does so without altering any unrelated genes. So it's, it's targeted variability. And what you, what you appear to have going on is like a warfare between two different organisms trying to gain the upper hand, specifically in predator-prey interactions, you know, such as uh, uh, parasitic organisms. You have them constantly updating their genes to try to defeat the, other, the system of the other. One trying to develop a toxin to get to paradise this one, this one trying to develop an antitoxin, and he, once he does, this one has to change it a little bit, and then he changes it, and that's what's going on. You know, there's a, there's a competition going on out there, and it is at the genetic level. Well, we also have to mm, propose the possibility that environmentally dependent variability exists. We like to think that it's totally random. You know, you produce ch children that are bigger and smaller, darker and lighter, just on some kind of random level. Even the genetic changes aren't random. That diversity it produces is random, and that natural selection just, just acts, acts upon that. But really, we have to recognize the length of time that's involved. And some of these organisms are extremely well adapted. You look at like the polar bear. I love the polar bear as an example. You find organisms that are so extremely well adapted. How could that be random? How could just randomly producing diversity and create an organism that is so highly adapted in such a short period of time? Well, we do have indications that there are environmental signals that are inducing variability. The one I've already mentioned is, are the antibodies. It, once it binds that antigen, then it's custom making an antibody to match. That's an environmentally dependent variability. There are other examples. There's one called the SOS response in bacteria. When bacteria are under stress, it has been widely known that variability is found in bacteria that are under stress. Thought to be random mutations, thought indeed to be the result of the stress. That the fact that it's under stress causes replication errors to occur. You know, but now we know that there are specific types of changes. Much of it's in the conotoxins. It's been found that changes during the SRS response bacteria are typically transitional changes as opposed to transversions. So we see an AT and T. There are specific types of changes involved. And it's now speculated that these types of changes are not the result of random mutation, but that there's a mutator mechanism that's involved with inducing variability when the organism is maladapted and Diversity is critical for survival. There's another example called the heat shock protein found in flies, found in salivary glands of flies. There is a protein that binds DNA that acts as a chaperone. And it was originally called the heat shock protein because it would detach when it was heat, when they were heat shocked. But it's now recognized that any stress 
will induce this protein to release from, this, from the DNA in these particular regions, allowing variability. So, at, under times of stress, variability is definitely allowed. And I think we have to understand that our genetic theories are based, the ones that, we've been, that have been passed to us are based on atheistic concepts. They're, they're not, design is not recognized, and if anything, the ability of an animal to adapt to its environment has been greatly underestimated. We like to, we like to limit evolution. We like to reduce what the evolution start claiming. But we don't have the luxury of millions of years to, in our theories or the development of these alleles. We know that this diversity can accumulate rapidly from a, even from a, a genetic bottleneck after just a few hundred animals introduced and then you see a massive bloom of genetic diversity. We don't have the luxury. So anything, the ability of an animal to adapt to particular situations in a very short period of time has been greatly underestimated. Random mutations are not involved. Cells has a mechanism, has a machinery in there to edit genes, and it's doing so as a result of environmental stimulus at times. Um, there's an example of a, a bacteria found in Yellowstone Hot Springs called Thermus aquaticus. It was found living at temperatures greater than it thought possible for life to exist. Specifically because proteins denature below these temperatures. All proteins possessed by that's the reason why you cook food. So to denature these to denature the proteins that are possessed by an organism and uh, kill it. And then lo and behold, we found bacteria living in Yellowstone hot springs at a temperature greater than all other life forms can can uh, live within. And so it was immediately recognized that well this Organisms must have proteins that are stable at higher temperatures than all other proteins. And in fact, some of the proteins isolated from this organism are now used widely in reactions to copy DNA, called a reaction called PCR, polymerase chain reaction. But we have to either propose that all or other organisms have lost this genetic information, has lost this ability, or that this organism has edited genes under regional specific selection and has adapted to this environment since it was created. We have many organisms that are living in environments now that probably did not exist before the flood, such as the Arctic regions. Any organism that is highly adapted to these severe environments, to predatory prey environments, chances are there were no predators before the flood, or at least at the creation, all animals seem to have been created to plants, and so any organism that possesses a predatory specific gene, predatory specific feature, those must have been developed since, since, and very rapidly through specific genetic modification of random reactions occurring. So why do, if we know that genetic diversity is being induced by the cell, why are mutations continuously claimed as, well, the origin of life and continuous evolution, or continuous production of diversity is reliant upon new genetic information. And for evolution to be true, there must be a mechanism there that's independent of <coughs> cellular processes. Genetic variability must have occurred before there were mechanisms present to produce that diversity. As well, intentional production of genetic information implies an intelligent design. To some extent, we have to understand that evolution itself is founded upon an atheistic concept. Scientific community today is overwhelmingly atheistic. Now here's a quote from Ernest Mayer, who's probably the godfather, the current godfather of a modern evolution movement. Mutation is the ultimate source of all genetic variation found in natural populations and the only new material available for natural selection to work on. So do not, they're not looking at the cell as having the ability to intentionally or purposefully edit genes and create new genetic information. Just assume random mutation is responsible for everything. But if you doubt that the scientific community is atheistic, Here's a report published in the 1998 issue of Nature stating that among top natural scientists, disbelief is greater than ever, almost totally. Biologists in the National Academy of Science possess the lowest rate of belief of all disciplines by far, with 95% either agnostic or atheistic. 95%, that's 20 to 1 ratio of believers to non-believers in the biological community, and that's what evolution is, the biological discipline. They have the dream team. It's the dream team they have working on this thing. And what we, what we are in is in a courtroom of public opinion. 
and you go into a courtroom any given day against 20 lawyers, and you're going to lose. And we're losing because they have the smartest and they have the best. They have the career, the career matter oriented people work they have with you. Evolution is a well thought out theory. And that's because they have so, so many people working on it. They've they accumulated so much evidence. But it's clearly based on atheistic concepts. And we have just haven't done enough. But instead of using their theories, unfortunately, that's what we've done. We kind of accepted some of their theories. And then, you know, as opposed to forget their theories, look at the data, look at the genetic variability that we see that's going on, and, and use the biblical timeline as a reference. The genetic bottleneck. How many of how much genetic information was there in the beginning? We don't know how, many was, how much was created, but we have a specific number from the flood, so we can compare that with what there is today, and we have to formulate theories based on some of that hard data and not just these outdated atheistic concepts that, well, genetic re rearrangement, they're just rearranging pre-existing genes and stuff. We just have to uh, look a little bit deeper in that. I have a little more I want to give you. We want to take a break. I want to give you some information on genetic transformations and how interspecies gene transfer just briefly a little bit and then we'll field some questions but uh, let's take a short break Most of the references I use are 
at you know five years old at most, and because uh, we really have to look at what's going to be the new, new information, and so. I, I've been waiting for some of this stuff to surface. I've always known that antibody, you know, diversity is not random, and just waiting for something to pop up that indicated it. What, I, the, what the single base pair substitutions that are occurring in human antibodies weren't linked to uh, to gene conversion, but until 2002. So you know, I just definitely try to look for some. You know, I'm just watching for this information to surface, and I can recognize the significance. God has given me some insight into this area, so I. I I, I, I intend to keep working. So, uh, I have some history in genetic transformations. And so this will blow you away even a little more so than, than possibly I have already. Because most people just do not realize that genetic transformation is also part of the design. That um, interspecies gene transfer between organisms is occurring. Um, Genetic transformations are now performed with regularity today. There is a lab specialized for doing genetic transformations on every major college campus in the country, without a doubt. All you need is a, just a few culturing hoods and some growth chambers and a, and a few techniques to perform transformations that are ready to go. When you insert new genetic information into a foreign cell, you, uh, you basically transform a cell with new genes, with new genetic information. Absolutely. Hmm. The last one on, but. <laughs> <laughs> this guy back here is working on your genetic variable. I guarantee you, with some of these techniques, it's undoubtable that I have a few foreign genes in my hands at least. I'll share with them. So it's the cell that has to work. Absolutely. Absolutely. The co cultivation of cells with DNA is all that's really necessary. You, cook, you have cells in the presence of DNA, and on some frequency, you're going to have a genetic transformation occur. Bacteria have been transformed for decades. In fact, it was the transformation of bacteria back in the 1920s that finally led to the proof that DNA was the substance that coded for traits, that it was the substance you were inheriting from your parents that determined what you look like. So basically, any stress will induce bacteria to uptake foreign DNA. Heat, salt, high salt concentrations, uh, starvation, you basically have DNA in the presence of bacteria and stress them a little bit, and it uses chaperone protein, brings up, brings that information in the nucleus and the splices in the genome. Other techniques for doing transformations by far is called the gene gun. This is a gene gun produced by um, DuPont, oh, that's patented as well by DuPont. One of these is on in every major college campus in the country. But um, if you produce anything with it, you pay royalties to DuPont forever. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's called the gene gun because you're basically firing DNA into cells using a high pressure delivery system. The original version of this gun had a 22 caliber pistol mounted on the top and blanks. What you do is you, uh, you coat fine metal, fine gold particles or tungsten, like a, a gold powder, with DNA. Shoot that out at the cells, and at some frequency, those cells will be transformed. Basically, you can throw DNA at cells really hard, and some of them will become transformed. <laughs> if you've ever seen a big tumor growing on the sides of trees, that's called crown gall disease. This is the most exaggerated version I've ever seen, but uh, if you've ever seen one of these tumors, that's called crown gall disease. That's a naturally occurring genetic transformation going on. There's a bacteria that is genetically transforming the plant. It does so as a parasitic strategy. It's called agrobacteria. And what it's doing is it inserts a gene into the plant that gets the plant to make an amino acid that the bacteria uses for food, that the bacteria metabolizes, but that the plant has no use for. So it inserts a gene in the plant, so the plant's making the food for the bacteria. But the tumor is caused by the fact that the bacteria is also inserting uh, growth regulators into the plant. In particular, it is inserting plant growth regulators into the plant. And this is basically showing the bacteria, the plasma, the plasma that uh, the piece of DNA that the bacteria uses for this transformation is independent of its genome. You have a big bacterial chromosome, and the bacteria have a lot of little pieces of DNA, circular pieces of DNA <coughs> called plasmids. These plasmids are shared between bacteria, and you when you want to transform bacteria, you insert one of these plasmids into the bacteria. Um, but it is inserting 
plant growth hormones into the plant. Genes that has, the bacteria itself has no use for, they cannot transcribe those genes into proteins, and the, the, the hormones have no function in the bacteria whatsoever. What I'm proposing is that that bacteria has at some point stolen those genes. That, that genetic transformations are occurring, those are plant genes that that bacteria has, and not all strains of agro have the exact same genes. They don't have the same amino acid gene that they're inserting in the plants, and they don't have the same plant growth regulators. They have at some point in plant's history, or in their history, have stolen these genes, have picked these genes up from plants, have inserted them into this plasmid, and are using them to parasitize plants. Absolutely, these plasmids are not constructed out of random mutations. These are genetic constructs. In the, in the lab, molecular biologists make what we call genetic constructs. You basically have this library of information available to you. You have enzymes that cut DNA at particular sequences, and enzymes that can splice all those pieces back together for you. You have genetic elements that can increase or decrease the strength of a gene, the, the rate at which it produces proteins. You have promoters that are specific for various organisms. If you want to insert it into the plant, you put a plant promoter on there. If you want to put it into an animal, you put an animal promoter on there, vice versa. You have this library of DNA information, and you can cut splices of stuff together to make constructs. These are just three genetic, these are the three constructs that I was using when I was working for Eden to go transform cotton and rice and such. Um, they might not be happy they know I'm showing those to you. <laughs> and this is the plasma that we use to uh, genetically transform plants. Um, what I'm proposing to you is that cells have the ability to perform some level of genetic engineering. All the, all the enzymes that we use to make constructs, we've isolated from organisms. All the enzymes to cut it, all the enzymes to splice it. Uh, and then I'm proposing to you that organisms possess that same ability. And standard, we're looking at, you know, the scientists there looking at genetic variability is all random and just random mutations and stuff. But this machinery was created by God. We really have to have the slightest idea what it's really capable of doing. And I am suggesting that the cell has, the ability, has an ability to actually make genetic constructs. That it can utilize foreign DNA this, 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 and bring, it brings some of that foreign DNA in and inserts it into a plasma that it's making and that uses this plasma to genetically transform plants. <coughs> okay, so that, that's kind of your fundamental point, right? Is, is the cell's ability to, uh, ability to adapt. Right. Um, as opposed to random mutations. Absolutely. Um, and the classic creationist model says that those adaptations or those, those genetic changes were, were latent or, or are dormant in the, in the cell, that, that they existed in the cell already. You're saying the cell actually changes, right? Right. And has that ability to change, which is created. Most of the diversity is claimed to just be from rearranging pre-existing genes. Okay. Like we saw in that one experiment with the flies, it has two different two different genes for the same trait, and by simply rearranging those, it can create a population that has different traits than the parents had initially. It's thought that just rearranging the genes that it already has is able to uh, create the bulk of the diversion that we find in populations today. Okay, well, what I'm wondering is, is, uh, is it possible that um, not only did God impart to the cell um, the ability to, to change and adapt, but also um, the anticipation of those changes so that in some sense that uh, there's, there's a, a
You have communities of animals and ecosystems. There are localized ecosystems. All those are big, the world's a big ecosystem, but there's, you have local ecosystems, different organisms that all live in common. And depending on what organisms in that area, you're going to need to adapt to that situation. Um, God knew that he could destroy the world by flood and reintroduce those animals, and they could survive to this, in this wasteland because he had developed, developed, created within them such an amazing ability to adapt. You know, and adapt in ways, uh, you know, we, we really can only imagine. I, I truly feel that, mm -hmm. if anything, the ability of animals to adapt is greatly underestimated. That evolutionists really still do not recognize that some animals have adapted from others because they just do not realize that there's a systematic and rapid ability to, to create potentially even new structures. I mean, like I said, if the, if the carnivorous diets have all developed, then you got to look at like the proboscis of the mosquito and things like this and recognize that that had to have been developed. That, I mean, some of it could have been there. It could have used that proboscis to draw nectar out of plants, but it, it possesses anti-drink genes for anti-blood coagulants and things, and it's a highly specialized structure now for using on animals and that you know, we say, but it's a, there are systematic genetic changes that are producing that. How how directed they are, how much environmental stimulation is involved with making specific conditions. I, we can only speculate, but we must. This system was created by God. It's created for that purpose to adapt to you know in, in an amazing amount of ways. And uh, it's that because the animals possess the ability to adapt, we we find it extremely difficult to identify the biblical kinds. I, I, I just am not sure. I mean, I look at animals like the platypus and have to wonder. Sure. I mean, the bill, insignificant. It definitely could uh, elongate out that bill, you know, through mechanism, uh, you know, at the paddle tail, insignificant, you know what I mean? Um, I think that there have been some developments there that we simply do not like, do not, don't want to propose. You know, we want to argue that evolution, you know, is. We are not as the animals are. We were created by God. I truly believe that. But this is, there's a, such an amazing system that's been designed. And we want to argue evolution so badly that we really don't want to theorize about these kind of things and propose them. There's an, one of my theories is related to the marsupials on Australia. Prior to the introduction of placental animals on Australia, all the mammals on Australia were marsupials. From a post-flood migratory pattern that is very difficult to explain. Very, very difficult to explain. And although the, the marsupial mode of reproduction seems drastically significant from the placental mode of reproduction, the fact remains they are all marsupials. And it's just the fact that so many animals that are all marsupials are going to make it down to Australia and no placental whatsoever, all connected. Uh, in addition to the fact that they're identical animals that are marsupials and placentals. Several identical animals. There was a marsupial dog. There's a marsupial squirrel. There's a marsupial mole. There's a marsupial anteater. Several animals that are identical placental forms, other than the fact they're marsupials. And I have to wonder, you know, whether or not what we should be doing is proposing that some common environmental stress, something common to all those animals, induced a systematic changeover from that one mode to another, and that all that was pre-designed. That 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 ability is already there and in a Cause that change in a coordinated fashion. Uh, I'm going to ask: Is there any ongoing work right now trying to determine where the how the barrier fit into this, and where the barriers are to the various physical types? It's very tough. I mean, yeah. reproductive incompatibility is really the only guideline that we have. But unfortunately, reproductive incompatibility develops. Speciation develops. There, species do, you know, do, but it occurs by design. It is instinctive. A speci speciation is instinctive first and becomes genetic later. Speciation first occurs through geographic separation. Some population simply migrates in another direction. After a period of separation, they can come across one another and will remain separate instinctively. They develop behavioral differences, mating rituals, color patterns that they use to distinguish one another, and it occurs by design for the same reason that God created distinct kinds so that the specializations that develop are not lost upon interbreeding, just like the specializations you created in the beginning would not be lost upon interbreeding. You have the polar bear now, highly specialized in the North Pole, and you have the panda, assuming they are, the panda bear is also part of the bear, highly specialized, and if they were able to interbreed, both of those specializations would have been immediately lost within their offspring. 
So speciation develops for the same reason that God created several kinds, hers by design, but, but that reproductive compatibility becomes certain through genetic distinction. The, in particular, following fertilization, the homologous chromosomes become unable to pair and cross over during the first mitotic division. And so genetic incompatibility does develop, definitely develops, heart speciation does develop, and that's our only guide for determining what, where the biblical kinds are. In addition to the fact that it appears that God created, this is what makes it really difficult, what evolution produces and what God created are similar in a variety of ways. God created groups of similar animals. He created a group of waterfowls, theoretically speaking. He created a group of birds of prey. Really can't be sure. I'm not sure if there's as much diversity in all the birds of prey as there is amongst all the dogs. But there's at least one reference, of, I think maybe it's much later, like most of refer to several different birds of prey. Assuming there's, it appears God created several distinct kinds, kinds of a group of hooved animals, you know, and I'd like to say a group of uh, waterfowl. There are groups of similar animals, but that's also what evolution does, is it creates groups of similar animals. From the, from the canine that was reintroduced from the flood, now we have a group of foxes, and we have a group of coyotes, fox, several coyote species, several wolf species, etc., that are distinct from one another. There are no real intermediates between those either. And potentially created several types that we now consider carnivores. The canine can probably distinct is types from the bears. And, but there's so much diversity possible that we really have a hard time putting that together. Is the panda bear related to the raccoons or to the bears? It's very difficult to know. These, there's a lot of similarity. I mean, one animal can become very similar to what is possibly another biblical kind. Um, created possibly more kinds that were necessary just to ensure the development of a proper ecosystem. You know, creating more than one birds of prey, although the ability of one of those birds of prey to di become diverse and actually almost look identical to one of the others may be possible. You know? I mean, we're not sure if the falcon, I mean, look at the amount of diversity that's in the dogs. That just blows you away. And you have to realize that came from a purebred wolf already. And is the Falcon, you know, and the eagle, are they so significantly different in comparison, you know? I would be willing to indulge, indulge the idea that they're different biblical kinds, that they were both on board the ark, but the diversity, you know, when we, all we can do is look at the diversity, the minimum diversity that we find through domestic breeding and apply that to natural populations, and as well look for reproductive distinctions, but like I say, those can develop too. So one of the things that's holding us up the most is the fact that we cannot identify the biblical kinds accurately there were not enough descriptions in the Bible. Well, very few. We know there was a dove and a raven, and but there were not enough. There were not enough descriptions that allow us to distinguish how, how many biblical kinds are really were on the ark and where those separation from the plant can mess with its genome significantly and still be an, a reproductively active uh, species because it doesn't need a pair. It doesn't need a partner that's reproductively similar. So plants actually have a much greater ability to uh, perform that kind of manipulation than even animals do. But one thing people don't realize is that as far as plants surviving the flood, is that every cell on the plant can undergo somatic embryogenesis and become an embryo. Any cell on the plant. So we talk about how the plants survive the flood. And the way we transform plants is we insert some new DNA into plant tissue, and then we culture that tissue until we isolate embryos from that tissue. They actually have to regenerate a plant from a single cell to do plant transformation. Or a seed. Huh? Or a seed. You cannot genetically transform seed. There is a seed from. Or a seed. You're talking about where the, where the tree are going to have to That's true. Some seeds could have survived. Seeds definitely remain dormant. Um, the seed has a hard enough, has a thick enough uh, seed coat to where it, it takes till the next year to decompose. So it, there's no precocious germination during winter or during dry seasons. There's enough of a seed coat there. It requires a year of decomposition before it will germinate. Um, it's pecans and cherry seeds. And some have to pass through the stomach and, and actually have acid burn through that seed coat before they'll germinate. So seeds can definitely survive the flood, but as well, any plant tissue, any surviving mass of tissue, of plants, under times of stress in particular, we employ that. 
to, in order to induce embryogenesis, we stress them a little bit and get them uh, that tissue to undergo somatic embryogenesis, embryos, and there you go, shoot them coming up. So. Uh, what's the latest thinking on uh, genes and traits uh, in the sense that I've read that a gene can affect more than one trait? Absolutely. And sometimes um, set, uh, set. Mm -hmm. I can think of almost none. Most proteins are a composite of many genes. A gene will produce a small subunit of the protein, and then that has to be all folded and assembled into place. Mm -hmm. As well, as I've shown, you can use template DNA to edit other genes. So the reason why you're able, able to produce such a, a vast quantity of traits may simply be due to the fact that genes are edited to, to create this diversity. There's a lot of diversity. What seem, almost seems like an endless quantity of diversity. I mean, we haven't reached the end of diversity by any means in the canine. We've been breeding these dogs aggressively, and that was from a purebred, and there appears to be no end to what we can do. And that's my point, that instead of us saying that there's a limited quantity of DNA and this diversity is simply the result of rearranging these genes, like in that fly experiment, you got two genes for eye color, two genes for body color, and just by doing that rearrangement, you get this diversity. You have a limited number of genes that are there that produce these traits. A bulk of the genome, is there to perform housekeeping functions. The majority of the genome doesn't vary, but so only a small percentage is actually variable, actually involved with the diversity of traits, and yet there appears to be an endless stream of new information that organisms could not generate. I enjoyed your talk today, and I'm very satisfied with the explanations that you've given us with regards to how, how uh, variety uh, comes forth.
control systems in your body that tell a cell to grow and divide or not. They become autonomous to those signals. Your body is recognizing signal, uh, your cells are recognizing signals from your body that tell it when to grow and divide, basically. And the genes that were producing proteins involved with that recognition system have become dysfunctional. And so a cancer cell is, about, for all intents and purposes, immortal. Your, why you actually die is still, by and large, a mystery. Your cells, if you provide them all the nutrients, if you provide them with the environment that's necessary for the absorption of the metabolites it needs, and that also, all your cells in your body are designed to continuously grow and replace each other on a never-ending cycle. The reason why you actually grow old and die is still, by and large, a mystery. Cancer cells themselves are immortal. They, have, they will grow and divide indefinitely. Um, they are independent of whatever is triggering your body to stop growing and dividing and what, what that actually is. But we are clearly designed to die at this point in time. Plants are immortal. Plants themselves are immortal. Yeah. You can kill them, sure, but if you provide them all the necessary sustenance, all, if you provide them with the space and the sun and all the nutrients that they need, they will grow forever. Some plants have adapted to annual growth patterns, um, but any plant that's an annual can be found elsewhere in the world as a perennial. Absolutely. There are no, there are, plants are immortal in comparison to animals still to this day, but we clearly are designed to grow and to die and cancer cells themselves. The gene has just been has just been become dysfunctional through mutation, you know. There are external sources of mutation, UV, you know, you can get too much sun and it can just damage your DNA beyond your cells' abilities to repair it. And uh, if that gene just happens to be one of those that was involved with the regulation of cell division, you're going to regulate it. You don't want cells just growing at their own rate, whatever rate they want to grow at, but it's a timing situation. You want them growing at a specific rate, and that timing is all set up by internal machinery. And if that gene happens to become dysfunctional due to mutation that's responding, that's part of that regulatory clock, then it will just grow independently. Yeah, um, you're talking about studying that the gray wolves when they're in the wild, like if, we, if there would have been some kind of variety, it kind of would have been kind of selected out or something, like say wolves, but right. when they're domesticated, because of different environment things, would the people start seeing the difference? Or I Correct. When you domesticate, when we domesticated, then we eliminated selection. The selective pressures that they were under in the wild were eliminated. Now, every single pup that is born from those is able to, it has the same chance of, of, uh, of producing more pups. But in the wild, that's not the case. Frequently, you have only one male in an entire area that ends up uh, siring all the pups, you know? And uh, that's how selection works. It favors one individual in the population over the others because it's just slightly more beneficial, slightly bigger, slightly more able to catch the prey, you know? And it doesn't necessarily mean the biggest one. It could be the smallest one that's able to catch the prey that's in that area, you know? But it causes a, a sh selective pressure, eliminates diversity by intensifying one particular trait out of a diverse set. That's a purebred wolf was under continuous selective pressure so that any continuous source of genetic diversity was culled from the population and kept pure because the selective pressure remained constant. If you will change that selective pressure, if you took population of wolves and moved it to a drastically different location, you would find that that population would change in just a few generations. But as long as selective pressure remains constant, the population will remain purebred. It will only produce wolf pups. Domestication is practically the elimination of any selective pressure, you know, because we can basically, you know, we will allow every pup to breed. It, but the fact, the reason why there's actually more diversity in the dog species than there is in any other species in the world because our selective pressures are more diverse as opposed to just focusing on beneficial, a beneficial characteristic, which was the beginning of breeding. You wanted a dog that could uh, fight bears, a bulldog, as you know, bred like to fight bears versus chase rats or, you know, or get rid of rats. So ours is more diverse, we, we just because we like the way it looks, you know? Right? So just, and so we, we have been more diverse with our selective pressure and, and generated all this diversity because in, in the absence of selection, the diversity will bloom. There's no mechanism for eliminating it. And then from that diversity, you do some breeding experiments and focus on one particular trait. Is it possible that a virus 
is a broken up fragment of, a, of what earlier was an independent cell. Um, vir vir a virus is a genetic system. Um, it's a very, very tricky question. But it's parasitic. It's, it's parasitic. Either we must propose, I, I think it must have been created. It is a genetic system. If genetic systems, generally speaking, have been created, the virus almost must qualify as one. It um, possesses a distinct structure. It has a genome inside of a protein body. It creates a protein shell for itself. It has, for all intents and purposes, our legs that it uses to bind to the cell that it would parasitize, and a proboscis type mechanism that it would use to insert its genetic material into the host. It possesses all, many of the characteristics we would attribute to a design system. Um, I think one of two things must, must be its purpose. If all things have a purpose, and I look for a purpose in everything that I think that God has created, then it must have like one or two purposes. It was either it was created specifically to create death and disease, because that is basically what viruses are to us today, or it's an interspecies gene transport shuttle. That it that it it takes gene, genes from one host and through the process of infection transfers them to others. I would be speculating on either case. But it, it I whether or not it's a rank, whether or not it's a runaway genetic system, yeah, it's possible. I tend to look at that as being a construct, it, that it was designed as well, and uh, that it, either its purpose is not right clear, clear to us yet, or, I mean, we know God cursed the world. We don't know how that occurred. We know it's, there were a bunch of curses involved, though, and, uh, and that death was brought into the world as a result of sin. The God created us initially to live immortal. And if we had eaten of the tree of life, that man would have lived in a moral state. We, we know that's possible, that we can live through in, in mortal, just like plants do, as long as we have all, but for some reason now we're pre-programmed to die. And whether or not the virus just wasn't unleashed on the world as a as a way of, you know, causing further death and I, I, I would guess that might just be the case. Just a couple more fun. Absolutely. I think as a creationist, as someone who recognizes that there's a system design here, well, you could do a lot of good, you know, uh, that if they were looking at this as, a, as, as if it was a design system that, that we would be able to advance much more rapidly, our theories would be more in line with looking for design and, you know, they're just looking for randomness. Every change to a gene they think is just a result of random mutation, and it's, it's like evidence has to finally surface and to convince them that that's not the case before they would even start looking in the right direction. If they were looking at this thing as if it was intelligently designed, we would be making much faster headway. Yeah. It's truly holding back scientists. One more thing. So uh, you talked a lot about recombination and mutation. Can you clarify exactly what the difference is between them? All right. It seems to, uh, a mutation is a change to a gene that is either through an external source or through errors induced by the cell. So it's, it's, it's a chain that is unintentional or through externally induced changes like UV bombardment, there are chemical mutagens. A recombination is a change that is intentionally produced by the cell. That a, muta a mutation can be caused by recomb a recombination error or a splicing error or a replication error if that's what a mutation is, it's an ch accidental change to a gene by the cell, or one that's introduced by external mutagens, or the recombination is an intentional change to the genome, to a gene by cellular mechanism. The fact of the matter is, it remains there. If it just depends on your perspective, whether or not the cell was intentionally trying to modify that gene or was a result of accident. But, we, but like I said, with the antibody diversity, they assume that the diversity in that region was a result of splicing errors. If that was true, those would have been mutations. If that splicing errors were involved with that hypervariability in the antibody gene, that, those would have been mutations. So that was their assumption. And like I said, 95, that was my textbook says in 95, that's recombinant DNA technology, the best textbook on the market, 95, so that exact same thing. Now we see that at, at variability is induced afterwards, after splicing, intentionally through the process of gene conversion. That's the difference. Mutation is an accidental in introduction of genetic variability. Recombination is an intro intentional introduction of genetic variability.
that's, uh, don't say you just get old information and then say this is <laughs> right up there on the cutting edge. It's going to be really interesting to see when that's published, what the reaction of the creation community is. Um, some people may be threatened by it. Your category rattled a little bit. Some will be very, very, uh, very positive, I'm sure. It's going to be very exciting. And Northwest, or nwcreation.net, right at the bottom there. So you can look it up now, and we'll see it in TJ and, uh, within a few months, it sounds like. That's great. Well, we thank you again, everybody, for coming. The hour is late. If you have questions, come on up front and talk to Chris a little bit longer. That'd be fine. And uh, just appreciate you all coming. Remember, no meeting next month. We'll see you all in September.